Hello, my name is Samuel Flores, and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Anasina Nikola for inviting me to her uh, be on her um, uh, thesis committee and uh, to give, uh, and give this talk. Uh, so I work at the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics, Stockholm University, and I run MedBioInfo. That's the National Graduate School in Medical Bioinformatics. Uh, I also do research in structural bioinformatics, and I do teaching in bioinformatics. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, how we can use redundancy in the protein data bank to compute protein-protein interactions. Okay, so we're going to start by talking a little bit about uh, my uh, code, Macromolecule Builder, or MMB. It runs in internal coordinates, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that buys us. Then I'm going to talk about Foldex. That's a, a, a protein stability uh, force field, which is also useful for protein-protein interactions. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, redundancy in the protein data bank, what I mean by this, and how it could be useful to us. And then we'll go on to show some results of computing delta delta G. So, uh, so what I mean by internal coordinates. So most uh, molecular dynamics codes work in Cartesian coordinates, meaning each atom is a point particle with three degrees of freedom. Um, but uh, MMB works in internal coordinates, and that means that the atoms are not independent. They are connected by so-called mobilizers, and there are three types. So the first one is a rigid mobilizer, and any two atoms that are connected by a rigid mobilizer uh, have zero degrees of freedom with respect to each other, right? That means that, um, let's say it's these two atoms in question, then um, their bond lengths can't change, their bond angles can't change, and neither can their dihedral, right? And so, so any network of atoms that's connected by rigid mobilizers becomes one body. I don't mean that it's in effect one body, I mean it, it really is one body internally. Like the, that means that um, this whole base, for instance, would have only one degree of freedom, which is the torsion uh, about its glycosate bond. So that brings us to these torsion mobilizers, right? So as I mentioned, the torsion mobilizer uh, allows you to change your dihedral angle, but it doesn't allow you to change your bond length or your bond angle, right? So it confers exactly one degree of freedom. And then lastly, there are these free mobilizers, and these do allow changes in bond length, bond angle, and torsion angle, right? And so, so that effectively gives you six degrees of freedom because internal coordinate bodies know about their rotational orientation, so three translations, three rotations. Um, so, so, and so, the, so um, I use the uh, a, um, a library called SimBody, uh, which on top of that has a library called Mole Model, um, and of course that's all inside of MMB, which as I said was uh, Macro Molecule Builder. So the nice thing about um, MMB is it allows you complete control over, over these mobilizers, right? So, so you, you can arbitrarily say for, for even a single bond, okay, I want this one now to be rigid, or I want this one to become free. Um, but more, more, more um, typically, you would specify bond mobility for entire stretches of residues. Like maybe you want to leave it at the, the default bond mobility, um, or maybe you want to define some domains that you want to keep rigid, and then th there should be some flexible region, let's say, between them if, uh, to make a, a flexible linker if you want to do some, some sort of domain motions. Or uh, maybe you want to just uh, look at what happens if the active site is flexible. Or maybe you want to fit some viral genome into a density map, but you only want to fit it one, one patch of DNA at a time. So you just flexibilize that piece. So it, it enables you to, to model some extremely large structures very efficiently. Like for example, we modeled ribosomal translocation with no problem. Uh, so we're gonna talk about protein-protein interactions today. So I use a, a force field called Foldex. Uh, and so, so what Foldex does, it, it helps you with this problem where 
Um, let's say you have a complex. Uh, let's say it looks like this protein A and some protein B. Uh, protein B, right? And they come together to form some complex like this, let's say. Right, and so, so the, the, the change in energy upon binding, um, you can just call that delta G. Uh, but there's a different change in energy upon binding if this A is mutated. So let's say your A now has some sort of modification. Right, that would make it A star. Uh, and then maybe B is not modified, or maybe it is modified, maybe they're both modified. Anyway, so, so then when it binds, it's got a different, um, a different um, change in binding in, in energy, this other delta G. And so the difference between these two delta Gs is, is what we're concerned about, right? We, we want to know how this mutation is going to affect binding. Is it, very often, um, what we're trying to do is increase binding affinity. Like for example, let's say you're trying to, you have some sort of therapeutic antibody and you'd like to lower the dose, uh, and increase the efficacy, then 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 you would want higher affinity. Um, it, you know, th there are other goals you could want, but this this is a, this is a very common goal. So um, so what you would want to do is look for mutations that um, that uh, that uh, make delta delta G negative. So that's delta delta G. Oops. You probably want that to be as low as possible in this case. And so, so what Foldex does is it, uh, it looks at, at all the atoms in, this, uh, in these two proteins, uh, let's, you know, and, and it computes uh, the interactions um, between atoms, and then it, it has, has some ways of taking into account um, things like the interaction with the solvent um, and the, the entropy that's, that might be, um, that, that, that's, that's that basically the, and that's the comes from the, the available conformational space of these residues, right? So, so it looks at things like the accessible surface area of, of these of, of, of all the atoms in your system, and how that changes um, when your protein then binds another protein, right? So you compute these two separately, and then you, you, you take the difference. And meanwhile, you're doing the same thing over here, except of course you've got different residues, right? And so these interactions within a monomer are different. Um, and then when they bind together, then the interactions between the, between the two, uh, across the monomers, are also going to change. Uh, and so, so it doesn't really do much in the way of dynamics. Um, when you introduce this mutation, like this is the mutated the residue, it does a little bit of a rotomer search to, to anneal any steric clashes, um, and maybe optimize the, the interactions a little bit, but, um, but most, of, most of the time these are pretty conservative and they never touch the backbone. This has pluses and minuses, right? So the nice thing about not uh, modifying the structure too much is that you don't introduce any biases that are inherent in, in your force field, right? So it turns out that if you try to use MD to 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 do this, like you you end up moving too much, and it ends up always um, deteriorating the the accuracy of your later delta delta G calculation. At least in our hands, that's how it's always been. So. Um, we, tr we did try to, to, to um, um, anneal this problem, uh, or I should say um, remedy this issue a little bit by um, doing a bit of, a, of an equilibration, but only in a region that's, that's directly affected by the mutation. That's to say these five residues here um, surrounding the, the mutation site. Uh, and th the idea behind five residues is that it gives you three backbone angles to well, it gives you it gives you it gives you six uh, five, five, sorry ten ten backbone angles to change, and that ends up being more or less uh, enough to give it give give the the middle residue the one you're actually mutating enough conformational freedom to to either get out of steric clashes or maybe take advantage of new favorable interactions that uh, that the wild type was not able to to make. And so, so, so it's sort of a compromise between um, MD, which moves everything and which again decreases accuracy, and Foldex, which moves very little and maybe could be improved. Uh, so, so we, we published that, um, but then we started looking at uh, what's what's happening in the protein data bank, um, 
and we thought, you know, what, what if we do take take a, try to try to compensate for this flexibility issue a different way, and um, instead of diversifying the structures computationally, why don't we just look for additional structures in the PDB that might be very similar, um, but not identical, right? They would they would maybe they would be the same complex. Um, but but uh, but crystallized under different conditions, uh, or, or maybe they would have like an extra ligand in there, but maybe it wouldn't affect us. Uh, maybe they would they would have some some small mutation or some mutation somewhere that didn't immediately uh, interact with the mutation site. Um, similar enough to where we could do the same calculation on all these structures and then just average the results. So so and again, so you're, again you're using this experimental data to this diversify. Um, your coordinate sets that you're using for this calculation, and then just just averaging should 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 improve this results. So um, what made us think that we could do this? Well, uh, you have to look at what's been happening with the protein data bank. So the 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 era of full discovery is is long over. Uh, I, I I the um, the last uh, new fold might have been discovered somewhere in the in the mid 90s, uh, but ever since then, um, the, no new folds. Uh, so so we're, we're basically looking at sort of finite set of ways proteins can fold, and yet we keep crystallizing proteins, right? So, and, you know, and it's actually at a, at, a, at a basically increasing rate. So what, what you see here on these um, orange squares is number of proteins crystallized per year. And I fitted a straight line to this. Um, and it's actually, I think it's actually a pretty good fit. Uh, it's it's not perfect. There is, uh, there are, Nonlinear components in there, but but they're very small actually. Uh, so 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 to a pretty good approximation, I would say um, the number of structures that you crystallize per year is increasing every year in a linear ma manner. And something that's kind of interesting is what happened in 2020. Right, that's the biggest increase uh, in the yearly rate of of, uh, of structure production, and it happened during the pandemic. Right. Despite the pandemic, despite the, all all the challenges that it brought, um, the, the uh, structural biologists were increasing the output. It's actually, I think, because of the pandemic. Uh, you, you you can read about how the structural biologists went into overdrive trying to crystallize um, uh, coronavirus proteins, um, trying to help with uh, creating vaccines, trying to help with creating a, a therapeutic, trying to help with um, understanding the basic biology of of, of um, coronavirus. So that I thought that was interesting, but of course the, the other thing is that, that what's happening to the total number of structures. Well, if you integrate a straight line, we get a parabola, right? So, so it's pretty logical that um, that the total structures uh, is is uh, increasing uh, quadratically. You can see that that you can fit a, a quadratic uh, curve pretty pretty well to to the number of structures. Um, not perfect. There's some like here. It could be, um, it goes over the, the curve here, it goes under. Uh, it turns out it's, it's not exactly quadratic either. But, but again, it's a pretty good approximation. So, so the point is that um, there are no new folds, but there, there is a lot of growth in the structures that are being produced. And so what's happening is that people are starting to, to crystallize the same protein uh, or, or same, same complex multiple times. Now, why would they do this? Well. Maybe they think they can get better resolution. Maybe they want to generate a mutation and they want to see how that affects the, the structure of the complex. Maybe they want to have a new ligand in there. There are many, many reasons uh, to do it. Um, but the fact of the matter is that we can only expect it to, to, to accelerate. And so, so um, we should start thinking about how to take advantage of it. So, um, so what, what I'm doing is, um, is looking for for proteins that are very similar to a protein that I already know about, All right? So so let's say that um, I know about this structure. It's, let's say it's antibody binding an antigen. It's got this chain A and chain B in the antibody, and it binds this chain C, right? And there's some mutation that I want to try. Like I would say, I don't know, I want to mutate chain A or chain B residue 175 to methionine, let's say. And see what that does to the interaction energy. Um, so, so the user would provide these three things, right? Like the, the, the structure, 
the mutation and um, how the subunits come together. So, so you would say, oh, A, B, A and B together are complex and they, they're always together and then they come in and they bind uh, C, which is, let's say, this antigen. So, so what you're going to do, or what, what homology scanner is, is going to do, so the, the, the program is called homology scanner. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to go search the PDB by sequence. And it's going to find um, uh, other, other <coughs> depositions in the, in the protein data bank which have uh, very high sequence identity to chains in uh, A, B, and C. If you have additional chains, let's say there's a D and E, it's just going to ignore those because you as the user specify that this is the complex you care about, this is the interaction you care about. So um, let's say it finds chains X, Y, and Z. So the next, this thing it's going to check for is, are they in the right uh, uh, tertiary fold, first of all, and secondly, are they right quad quaternary confirmation? Because what's possible is that, is that these are very similar structures uh, in sequence but they come together in a different way, right? Let's say, let's say this this an, this antigen here, and this other structure is part of a complex, and the an, the antibody is actually binding some other member of the complex, right? It's gonna, it's going to try to superimpose those, and it's going to say, ah, the RMSD is um, is let's say higher than six Ohmstroms, right? So reject. On the other hand, it might find another structure uh, where it has the same chains, but now they are um, binding. Uh, this this is chain Z, which is similar to chain C, in exactly the same way, or, or close to the same way. Like R must be less than six ohm strips. They say, okay, I'm going to accept this complex. And so now you have a list of two complexes, the one you started with and this very similar one that you just found. And then you, you go to Foldex and you say, okay, calculate the, the effect of this, this mutation on this complex, and then calculate it again in this other complex. And you average over those, those two results. So what kind of results did we get? Uh, so here we're, we're, we're um, testing it on lots of structures that I got from Scampi. So Scampi is a, um, is a, is a publicly available data set of protein, protein uh, interactions, right? basically uh, delta delta Gs. People did mutation experiments, measured the change in binding energy. And, but these are, these are delta delta Gs where we also have uh, a structure. And the results are kind of interesting. So, so let's, let's see what we're looking at. These black dots, these are the, doing the calculation on single structures. And you can see we've got some really crazy outliers here. Like for example, look at this one. That is, um, uh, we've got a predicted delta delta G of eight kilocals per mole, but the experimental was only about two kilocals per mole. So it's way off. And there are, there are a bunch of outliers. Here's this one, here's this one, there's two here and so on. I don't know if I should say a bunch, but there are a fair number of outliers. Um, uh, here is a different case where um, we have the same experiment. You can tell because they're all in the same um, column. This experiment that gave us something like seven kilocals per mole, but the calculation gave us kind of a variety. Like there's some here with about three kilocals per mole. There's some with uh, maybe two kilocals per mole. Um, and so what we do is for this mutation, we take the average. And so that's what this little green circle is. That's the average over all of the structures. And one thing you might immediately notice is that there are no green circles among the outliers. You see up here, there's no green circles, uh, no, none down here. I mean, there, some of them are better than others, but none of them are what I would call really, really, uh, you know, a serious, remark notable outlier. So that's already pretty encouraging. Um, and so in particular, we're going to try to look at things like the, the um, false positive rate. So, so, so what I mean by, by, by true positives, false positives. So, so if, you're, if your goal is to improve affinity, what you're going to do is you're going to try a bunch of mutations uh, computationally. And the ones that give you the, the lowest delta delta G, those are the ones you're going to want to actually try in the lab. Right? So, so let's say you're, you're cut off is minus one kilocal per mole. If you were using single structures, all of these guys here, every, all these black dots that you see here would be false positives. 
because those are predicted to have good uh, negative delta delta g or delta delta g be low minus one, but they're experimentally above zero, right? So they would actually um, decrease binding affinity. Um, one thing that you will notice, so, so yeah, so these are all false positives and anything over here on this side would be true positives. All right, anything below this line and to, to the left of the vertical axis. Um, and so you notice that the false positives are all single structures. There is not a single green circle in, in here among the false positives, right? There are plenty of green circles here among the true positives. So our true positive rate is looking really good, right? And so that, that's what I'm doing over here. Um, what I did is that, was I computed um, positive predicted value. So positive predicted value or PPV is true positives divided by true positives plus false positives. So let's go, let's go back here again. We said th this, this is the true positives here and these are false positives. So anything below this line, you want as many of those to be over here on the true positive side, right? And that number for the case of single structures is about 0.5, right? So that means that, that if you chose cutoff somewhere between, so anywhere below minus one, uh, it varied a little bit, you, you could expect more or less half of them to be true positives and the other half to be false positives. Ah, maybe that wouldn't be too bad. Um, there, there actually are reasons why that's a little bit optimistic actually. But um, the, the point is that, you, that even if it is one half, that means that half of your experiments would be kind of wasted in a sense, in, in the sense that they don't take you towards your practical objective. Now, what happens if you use average structures? Then your positive predicted value goes up to unity for all the mutants below minus one kilocal per mole predicted delta delta g. Think about what that means. That means that 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 all of these mutants would have been productive. Like you 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 would you would send someone to the lab and they would they would they would uh, express these mutants and they would evaluate their affinities uh, you know with biocore or whatever. And they would all be improving your affinity. That, that, that's, that's pretty amazing, actually. Um, and again, th there are reasons why this is optimistic. This is, this is based on a published data set. And there are actually reasons why, um, in a practical situation, you wouldn't get it, a positive predictive value quite this high. Uh, but, but anyway, th th based on, based on, on benchmarks, uh, this is actually really, really good. So, um, so again, um, what, what, we're, what we're trying to do is, is get as many uh, structures as possible and repeat the same calculation. And uh, we're hoping that the, the, the root n fluctuations will be decreased, right? Uh, it turns out we can't decrease them to zero because your, your, your error has uh, a, a random component, which is maybe like this, uh, random, and some systematic component. Right, the systematic error is it includes things like um, the error in the delta delta g experiment, because yeah, I mean you you you're using experimental delta delta g's, um, and and they, they they have errors, and it depends on the on the technique, of course, but none of these have have zero error. In fact, I think the the experimental error dominates here. And there's also error in foldex there there's uh there are implicit biases and everything you know all the assumptions that, that were made uh behind the force field that there's a bias uh, behind this idea that that you only look at the complex and the separate um, subunits so all, all of these things are are issues that we have not addressed in this work we have only addressed this issue of the random error um and so 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 if your your total total error is your let's say your root mean square error then um, then you would expect uh, that your root mean square error squared, so basically just dropping the R, um, is equal to your systematic error squared plus your um, your error for one um, for one mutation squared divided by uh, oops, divided by n, right? And that would give you this curve here. You can see it doesn't actually follow the data all that well. It's it's encouraging, I would say, but it it, it, it seems like there's more to the story. 
you know, I think I think the issue goes back to there's some there's some bias from if you go back to scatter plot, which was a few slides back. Uh, um, you see that that the slope is not unity. Uh, you see here here's a slope, and so that means that there um, that that these two types of errors might be uh, might not be independent. Uh, so 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 I have to work on this a little bit more, and um, people who are better at making statistical models than perhaps I am um, are very welcome to 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 shout out a commentary. Uh, we're almost at the end, so you can do that now. And um, so, so next step after this was to uh, uh, to distribute this. And so what I did is I made a web server. Actually, I, I had some help with this. Um, there were two students in uh, in my bioinformatics course at uh, at Uppsala that uh, that uh, wanted to do this as a final project for a different course. And um, so they did that and. What you do, or what you, what the user does, is they they provide a PDB ID of one one structure that has the complex they care about, uh, and then they decide um, how they want this complex to come together, right? So here, they, they, maybe they said chain A interacting with chain B, right? And again, we're gonna homology scan scanner is gonna uh, ignore anything that's uh, that's not specified as part of this complex, and then uh, they're gonna specify a mutation. And um, and the, the, what the web server does is it, it then queries the, the the protein data bank and it, it says, okay, give me all your all the structures that have uh, sequence identity, you know, something like uh, ninety nine percent for for the chains that, that this person cares about. And so they so it pulls them in. This is okay. Now we have to check the tertiary and quaternary structure. It does that, <clears throat> and then it computes uh, does does the full dex calculation on all of the structures that are found in this way. So um, these are stored, of course. Um, and so anything that's ever been computed is always going to be available to the public. And so you, you can just go right now to biodesign.sci.lab.se and see if the calculation you care about has already been done. It, actually, you don't even have to check. Like you can just go ahead and submit it and, um, and it'll just send you an email and say, hey, hey this, is, this has already been done for you. But it doesn't just just do that. It goes like if you submit something that's already been done, it, it goes anyway and checks the PDB to make sure there aren't any new structures that maybe could be added to this calculation. Um, so so just getting the answer actually could, could take could take some, some amount of time. Uh, speaking of time, mostly we're just talking about minutes. Um, occasionally it could be hours. In rare cases, it could be days. And that these these are these are very pathological cases where let's say it's somebody cares about an antibody binding to another antibody, right? And so there are lots of antibody structures in the in the PDB, and, it, and and some of these structures have you know you know many many antibodies in the same asymmetric subunit. And so it's going to try every possible combination of chains to, to see you know wh which combination of chains will, will look most like the one you submitted. So that that could take some time. There's some factorials in there, uh, but most of the time that doesn't happen. Then we have um, this compute node. Um, and so this is only something I only use when I'm doing benchmarking studies. Like most of the time, because it is so cheap, um, it, your user calculations will be done right on the web server. Uh, there's a there's a Slurm queue on there that, that has three cores dedicated to it, and that, that's that's enough. Um, I I also have this um, single board computer implementation, which is you know I, I use the the UDU x86, which is kind of the Rolls Royce of single board computers. And by Rolls Royce, I, it, it costs three times as much as uh, Raspberry Pi, maybe. Uh, but it, but it's it's a lot easier and better to work with because compiling for the ARM uh, can can be tricky. Um, and so so what I want this test bed format. Well, I, I've been in discussions with a couple of pharmaceutical companies, and always this issue of privacy uh, comes up. And so this is something where, where you could you could give them a single board computer. And um, they don't actually have to connect it to the internet. They can just they can just have it completely standalone, no Ethernet adapter, uh, and, and test it out. And um, and if they don't like it, um, they can just throw it in the trash because they didn't invest that much in it. And actually, you could you could actually use it as your primary uh, uh, primary sort of server for this because because again, this this is this is really not very expensive, computationally speaking. 
Okay, so I would encourage you to use that server. And with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, a few people. Uh, so Michael Sherman is uh, Chief Software Architect of Symbiles. So, so he wrote a lot of SimBody, and he still, even though he no longer works at uh, Stanford, he's still very engaged in the answers questions. Gene Cherney, he, he's the one who invented uh, nucleotide conformers, or NTCs, and uh, which we didn't talk about in this talk, but um, he's, he's, he's become very invested in MMB because that, that's, that's the vehicle that he uses to, to distribute NTCs. He's now provided three postdocs who actually go in and modify, write new code for MMB. So he's been, it's been a really good collaboration. Uh, Fred of Denmark, he uh, works at the tech support uh, Siloff lab and he's helped me with some server issues. Uh, very helpful guy. Uh, Pavel Plevka, uh, he's provided some density maps, actually, which I actually didn't show in, in this talk. Um, so maybe not so relevant, but um, uh, Michal Mali is uh, um, a postdoc in Gita Cherny's lab, and uh, he has been very helpful. He's, he's written a lot of code for, for MMB. Um, C++ genius. Um, and so I very much appreciate what he's contributed. Um, so, like I said, I, ran, I run MedBioInfo, the, the National Graduate School of Medical Bioinformatics. And if you are a bioinformatics student starting your PhD or soon to begin, I encourage you to apply in February. Uh, actually, if, it's, if you're thinking about this and it's not anywhere close to February, then you can still contact me and, and hear about how you can involve, get, be, be a part of the school in some way. And um, this is funded by Wetenskapsrådet, uh, Swedish Research Council. Uh, and uh, of course, I work at Stockholm University. So with that, I'd like to turn it over questions.